This is Flip Mini Lecture number 18, and in this one, we're going to finish chapter 8. All we have left to do in chapter 8 is 8.4 and 8.5. 8.4 is basically uh, reasoning about problems like if I have a bucket of water in my hand, and I swing the bucket of water around, it's a bucket of water. If I swing it around fast enough, no water will come out at the top. If I swing it around too slowly, the water will pour out at the top. So in 8.4, Knight analyzes that kind of thing, and we're going to actually cover 8.4 in class just by doing the corresponding workbook problems for 8.4. So let's go on straight away to 8.5, which is called Non-Uniform Circular Motion. Now I was a little bit surprised to see how few people in either class answered this question. If I have uniform ro angular rotation with frequency, angular frequency omega and a time delta t passes, how much angle is traced out? So the picture here is something's going uniformly around in a circle. Theta is probably measured nice and simply from there. In a time delta t, we're going to see this thing move to a new position. That means there's going to be an angle here, delta theta. And when I asked in class, in both classes, uh, how much is delta theta if you're going around with angular frequency omega, very few people said uh, delta theta equals omega delta t. And the reason that's a little bit distressing is this is, a, this is a definition, practically. So I want to, as my way of getting you into 8.5, I want to review the definitions. In fact, I'm going to review all the definitions to date. So if we have, say, a one-dimensional problem, and the one-dimensional problem is described by a position x, then the displacement is x final minus x initial. That's what we call delta x. This is the average velocity. It's negative if delta x is less than zero for some time delta t. Okay, and then we can define the limit that delta t goes to zero. This is what we call the instantaneous velocity. And since all of you in your calc class are now far enough along that I don't have to write out the definition of the derivative anymore, I can just say, well, this is dx dt. That's the instantaneous acceleration. And again, because you've all got calc under your belts at this point, we can say, oh, the instantaneous acceleration is just the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. Now, this gets a little worse when you have three dimensions. Now, physicists get bored writing out component equations, so they summarize all three of those things as R. And physicists get bored writing out Vx, Vy, and Vz. We summarize all three of those things that we've just defined as V equals Vx, Vy, Vz. And physicists get bored writing accelerations out all like that, so we just write A equals AX, AY, and AZ. And now that we have these vectors, we can kind of capture all this as V is by definition dr dt, and A is by definition dv dt. And these things have vectorial, pictorial uh, interpretations that don't have force you to resort to components. We can draw pictures of all these things, and you have, early on in the course, drawn pictures of all these things, and they have physical interpretations independent of the coordinate system. Okay, now I reviewed all that, and now I want to review this business of angular velocity. Angular velocity, or angular frequency as it's sometimes called. Well, if you're doing it as an average, it's just theta at t plus delta t minus theta at t 
over delta t. Of course, we don't have to do it as an average. We can take the limit that delta t goes to zero, but let's just stick here for a moment for the average definition. So that would say that if I have some time delta t over which a particle has an initial value of theta and a final value of theta, so this is theta final and this is theta initial, and this here has the interpretation of being delta theta, which is equal to theta final minus theta initial, or if you prefer theta at t plus delta t minus theta at t, then we define the average change in theta with respect to time as being whatever this value is minus whatever that value is divided by the time difference that's elapsed. And in uniform circular motion, that's all there is to it because the amount of angle swept out is simply directly proportional to delta t. If I wait twice as long, I get twice as much angle swept out. If I wait three times as long, I get three times as much angle swept out. So that's what it means to be uniform circular motion is that the change in theta over the change in t is just omega and omega is fixed. And so then that's why, since this is basically the definition of uniform circular motion, I expected people so to just go boom. Oh yeah, how much is swept out in a time delta t? It's omega delta t. Just solving that equation because this is the definition. Okay, now 8.5, this is a great time for me to have reviewed all this because in 8.5, Knight lets the dogs out and says, we're not going to just do uniform circular motion anymore. We're going to let this thing maybe speed up and slow down in its angular uh, progress around the circle. So here's a drawing that's going to illustrate non-uniform circular motion. First off, I've just drawn the nice simple situation of uniform circular motion. I tried to make that vector there the same length as that vector there. So that's uniform circular motion. And if this thing was going around with speed angular frequency omega, this would be omega r. And this would also be omega r in length, but pointing a different direction. And if we bring this vector over to here, we see that it's going to end up looking like that. And then we've been, been through all this business where we figured out what the size of that little vector was there. And we discovered that the acceleration was a proportional to r omega squared. But now we're going to do the non-uniform case. So suppose this is like a uh, clover leaf on a freeway on-ramp. Okay, so you're going around this nice circular corner on the freeway on-ramp but you're getting ready to accelerate onto the freeway. Maybe the freeway's coming through here. And you're gonna like go on like that. If you're getting ready to accelerate onto the freeway, that means that this vector isn't just a little turn from this vector. This vector is a little turn and a little longer. And this direction right here, we already understood, was minus r omega squared times r hat. To the extent that this vector has gotten a little longer, that just means we now have some theta hat piece. And we call this theta hat piece, we call that the tangential acceleration. Now I'm looking at the bottom of page 195 and just trying to match up what I just derived for you with what Knight is deriving for you. And uh, Knight wrote something that looks almost the same. What I wrote was minus r omega squared times r hat plus the in tangential acceleration times theta hat. Now, I could call the entire coefficient here of r hat, whatever it happens to be, I could call that a radial. So now I have that the acceleration vector resolved into this radial component 
and into this theta component, I have that the acceleration vector is equal to a radial times r hat plus a tangential times theta hat. And then the next thing I need to do to make my stuff look a little bit more night nights is I need to multiply both sides by m. We have f net is f net in the radial direction times r hat plus f net in the tangential direction times theta hat. And as always, we have Newton's second law, which says that f net equals ma. Well, the coefficient of r hat on f net must equal the coefficient of r hat on ma. That means this must equal that. Similarly, this must equal that. So your strategy then is to add up all the radial forces and set them in equal to m times the acceleration in the radial direction and add up all the tangential forces and set them equal to m times a tangential. The only thing that you need to do to finish all this stuff off is to know that a radial is minus r omega squared and a tangential, I haven't actually given you the formula for, a tangential is r d omega dt. Why? Because this is the rate of change of the length of this vector. This vector here at this point had length r omega, and at this point here had length r omega final, then the difference in length of this vector is r omega final minus r omega initial. And if you take the limit that delta t goes to zero and divide by delta t, then you're finding that the change in length of that vector, which of course is the acceleration, is just r d omega dt. And this thing has such a frequently recurring thing and is so much like acceleration, we give it a name, we call that r alpha where this is called the angular acceleration. So now you know that r uh, alpha is the angular acceleration, and alpha is d omega tt. And just like for uh, constant acceleration problems uh, with position and velocity, we can have constant acceleration problems with angle and angular velocity. That is to say, we can have problems where alpha itself is a constant, which means that omega is steadily increasing with time. So let's just summarize that last idea, that alpha itself might be a constant. Alpha is equal to d omega dt. This says that the angular velocity is smoothly changing. Then you're going to have this formula for delta theta. Delta theta is equal to whatever the initial angular velocity was times delta t plus one half alpha delta t squared. So there's going to be problems to illustrate uh, Knight's section 8.5, um, which is about cha changing angular velocity, non-uniform circular motion. And uh, in those problems, uh, this will be a kind of a common formula to use. Uh, of course, you know how to get it because you know how to get formulas like this. Delta x is equal to v naught times delta t plus uh, one half a delta t squared. You know exactly where that came from. So you can also see exactly where this came from. That's the end of chapter eight. Next will be chapter nine, work and energy.